right? A lot of us are experiencing the influence, the influences or the attacks of a spiritual atmosphere. Uh, a lot of us are, are dealing with a clash of kingdoms, a clash of kingdoms. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? They're, 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 when, when you're going to start to walk with the Lord and you begin to walk with the Lord, um, you know, I've, I, you've heard me say this before, you know, it's, it's, you know, how many here remember, I, I quote it once in a while, how many here remember the movie, The Matrix? You remember that movie, The Matrix, right? And you remember that everybody like, like, right, Mr. Anderson, whatever. In the beginning, it was like, it was like he, he thought that the agents were just FBI agents, just like you would if FBI agents show up, whatever. Once he came out of the matrix, they just manifested. They just moved through people in front of him. And this is what happens when you, when you give your life to God, all of a sudden, the, the demons start to manifest. All of a sudden, what, what, what you thought was one thing, it starts to manifest as another. The, the, the opposition starts to just show itself. Uh, in, a, in a more obvious way because the devil knows, all right, my, my trick of deceiving them is not working right now, so I'm going to use intimidation. I'm going to use rejection. I'm going to use persecution. I'm going to use throwing them into a trap because, because I, I can't hide anymore, right? We've heard this many times that um, where the greatest trick of the devil is, is, is pretending that he doesn't uh, that he, that he doesn't exist or convincing people that he doesn't exist. And if you guys want to hear something funny, um, I was on a trip uh, uh, with my wife once, and um, I, I think I said this here once before, and f I think for the first time, it was a small plane, I got sat in the front, I'm like, yes, finally, I'm sat in the front, and then this, uh, and I'm with my wife, and then this girl comes last minute with this huge dog, uh, you know, that's, it's her comfort dog, it's cool, the hair was all over the place, but you know, I'll be, you know, it's cool, but then she sits next to me, and she's like, oh yeah, so what do you do, and then I told her, you know, I'm a pastor, and she's like, oh wow, well, I'm part of the Church of Satan. And um, I just wasn't in, in Texas. <laughs> like, okay, cool. It's going to be an awesome trip. I thought, well, I finally, I'm in the front. And the Lord was like, the first shall be last. I'm like, okay. <laughs> yes, I'm first, so I guess I'm last. Um, and then she was like, I think she even said, it's going to be a long conversation or something. I think she even said that. She was like, because I have so many questions for you. She was like, I'm part of the Church of Satan. And, um, and she said, and, and I, was in, uh, I live in Texas. And then... Um, in Texas, they just, uh, this was like right when they overturned Roe versus Wade, right? Like right after. And she's like, so in Texas, I couldn't get an abortion. Um, so you can only get an abortion through the Church of Satan. So I went through the Church of Satan and got an abortion. And I'm like, okay, and that wasn't a sacrifice, right? Um, and then so, and then, and then funny, this is what, God really glorified himself there. Towards the end of the trip, she said, I'm never going to forget this flight. I'm never going to forget. Because every issue she brought up, you know, obviously I can't do this. Coincidentally, I've lived. She said, well, well, well I, I got an abortion because I'm an alcoholic. And this is, a, this is a girl like in her late 20s, you know. I got an abortion because I'm an alcoholic. And, and I don't want to bring a child into this world that, is, that is, uh, uh, maybe has a predisposition towards alcoholism. And then I said, well, you know what? My father was a heroin addict. And I was born a month early, and I was jaundiced, and I was in an incubator for a month, and I was supposed to die, and I, and I, and I got a full blood transfusion as an infant. And, then, and, then, and, and, and I go, and yes, I dealt with depression. I dealt with schizoaffective disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, manic depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, but God delivered me from, from them all. And even, and even with the depression that, 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 that I've experienced, there, there is no, there's no way to, to define or quantify the beauty of life, even with all the suffering that I've been through. And I'm so glad that my mom let me make my own choices instead of making that choice for me. And she was like, I guess stunned by that. And then she was like, well, what about all this stuff with, with, with you know, and, and, and the way Christians are with the LGBT community and with all this? And I go, well, I met my sister as my brother. And so what happens is, and, then, and, and she was bringing all these things up. And then, and then she was like, well, how is it that you have all these experiences? I'm like, I don't know. It's not on purpose. And, then, and, and, you know, it's just what happened to me. I've had a wild life. And then she's like, and what about those that are mentally ill? And I'm like... Well, I was diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder. I was, I was really out of order. I can laugh now. I wasn't laughing then. But anyways, and, 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 and she was touched and she says, wow, I've never met anyone like you. And I'm never going to forget this conversation. And the thing is that, but one of the things that she told me as a Satanist, and I'm like, that's fascinating. She's a confessed Satanist. And she says, well, we don't believe that the devil really exists. We just, we just say that so that, you know, uh, to be rebellious. And I'm like, the devil is so clever. He got you to, to use his name to call yourself by his name and go around saying he doesn't exist. <laughs>
That's his trick. That's what he wants. He wants to make it seem like he doesn't exist. Oh, just go about your business. Just go about your business. And so what happens is when you get born again, when you get born again, it's like, it's like, it's like you, you're, right, all of a sudden you're getting the director's cut. All of a sudden you're seeing behind the scenes. All of a sudden now you're going to start seeing the things that you thought were just regular life or thoughts that you thought were things that you thought were normal about your life are actually not normal at all. And, and when you start to get awakened spiritually, you know, your eyes open, you start seeing the truth everywhere. And I, obviously when we're born again, this is what happens, this is what happened to me. You start seeing things everywhere and everything starts to make sense about your life. And so the enemy just manifests in different ways now because he knows, all right, you know, the cat is out the bag. He, they know that I'm real. They know that, that, that I have my own plan. You know, they know, they know what's going on with this. But um, so let me just use intimidation, persecution, uh, sabotage, uh, offense. Let me use th those things because I can't just hide now. I don't know if you guys are with me. And so, and so this is, this is um, we're in a clash of, king, uh, of kingdoms and atmospheres. And, and, and as you mature spiritually, one of the things that happens is you become aware when you face or confront uh, an atmosphere that is adverse, that is of the enemy. It's something that you become aware of. And so the enemy wants to keep you unaware. And there's many of you that think that this walk is super difficult and don't know that your opposition would cut in half if you would just get yourself out of the wrong atmosphere. What, what, what is happening, and, and, and so I, I, I was sharing this with someone last night, um, with someone I was, we were praying for, and it, it was crazy because the Lord brought us, he brought me back, you know, to, to LA in 2018. Uh, for those that know, I'm originally from here, but in middle school, my mom moved uh, me to Miami, which I did not agree to, but I was a minor. And so, um, and the Lord, but the Lord called me back. It's a whole story. And so we were pastors out there, and the Lord was like, we were doing well, we were stable, we were good financially. The Lord was like, nope, that's it, go to California. Well, absolutely no connection and no GoFundMe. And so the Lord brought us back, but he brought me back at the end of 2018. And we were, we were, you know, going, evangelizing, all these things. And it got to a point where maybe I want to say 2021, 2022 maybe, where I was like, Lord, did I make some mistake? Is this, is this, is this really where you have us? And I remember that we're under the network of Bethel Church. For those that have heard of Bethel Church, that's we're, we're under their network. And we went with their leadership to a, a, a thing out there in Reading. And this woman came up to me, one of the leaders, and she goes, the Lord called you where you are. The Lord called you. The Lord called you to L.A. The problem isn't that you've done something wrong. The problem is that you've hit up against an atmosphere. And so this is something that I have seen more. And, and by the grace of God, we, there are atmospheres, demonic atmospheres everywhere. And I'm getting somewhere with this. There are demonic atmospheres everywhere. We've evangelized in a lot of different places. By the grace of God, my first mission trip was in Haiti right after the earthquake. And we, we've been in a lot of different uh, atmospheres. Even there, there were different, different atmospheres. In the city, and the mountains, different. So we've been all across the world evangelizing, right? South America, all across the world, uh, uh, Asia. And, and so we went, and I, even in New York, we went and evangelized. I evangelized um, in the neighborhood that my mom is from in the projects. We evangelized in Times Square. And, and we, we faced some, some pretty serious atmospheres. But it's, it's, it's interesting. One of the things that the Lord showed me is out here in L.A., this is more of a war of atmospheres than anywhere else. There is a war of atmospheres here. There are, is a war of atmospheres so that everything that happens here has to be birthed in worship and prayer. Everything that happens has to be birthed in worship and prayer. And so, and so what happens is, this is in Hollywood. We're literally physically in Hollywood, right? But that's not the industry of Hollywood, but it's close. And so what happens is the industry of Hollywood is all about making something appear real that isn't. And so, and so here, this is very difficult spiritually because the enemy has more ability here to make something appear real that isn't. And so when we're not in prayer and we're not in worship, the enemy is going to use the atmospheres. He's going to use an adverse atmosphere to, to bring deception. And why is deception deception? Why is deception deceiving? Well, this, because deception, if it was just words from a demon talking like it's you, you know, because that's what it does. It doesn't say you were this, you were that, because then you'd be like, hey, who's talking to me? You know? it, says, it says, I'm this, I'm that. If it were like that, then it wouldn't be so hard. But what happens is if, if, if you can have angry thoughts and think it's ridiculous, but if now you're in the atmosphere of anger, have you ever been angry and then everything makes sense? Sometimes the most crazy, impulsive, wrathful things to do and say make sense because the atmosphere has lied to you. 
And when you come out of the atmosphere, you say, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Because you didn't perceive the atmosphere. Why, why, why didn't you perceive the atmosphere? Because, because you weren't in the spirit to be able to discern another spirit. What does that mean? That means when you're in the spirit of God, you pick up when something is not the spirit of God. And we know what the Bible says, right? The things of the spirit are foolishness to the carnal man. It says because these things are spiritually discerned. And it says, nor can he know them. So this is why when you're not in this, this is why when, 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 when Nicodemus got along with Jesus and he said, and he told Jesus, look, all right, look, my friends aren't around. Let me talk to you real, real quick. You know, let me do this thing, right? And he goes, I know that you're from God, right? Because nobody could do the things that you do. So I know that, what do I got to do to be born again? Like, I can't go back into my mother. Like, you know, what can, and then Jesus doesn't even explain it. He goes, those that are of the spirit are like wind. You hear it sound, but you don't know where it came from, and you don't know where it's going. When someone is in the spirit of God, under the influence of the spirit of God, you don't understand what's happening. And so he said, you have to be born again into the kingdom. You must be born of water and spirit. In other words, I can't even begin to explain these things to you unless you have the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is revealing it to you. This is why Jesus is the person of the word, and as the person of the word, he told Peter, uh, some say I'm Elijah, some say I'm, I'm the prophet. Who do you say I am? And he says, I say you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And he goes, blessed are you, Peter, because flesh and blood could have not revealed that to you, but my father is in heaven. Why didn't he say, blessed are you, Peter, because flesh and blood could have not revealed that to you except me? Because he is acting as the word, and the father has to reveal the word by the Holy Spirit. And, 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 so, and so he was saying, you, it needs to be the spirit you have, the Father has to approve the Spirit of God for you to understand my words. Amen. And then he walked away when he said, you will eat my flesh and drink my blood. And he said, the words I speak are spirit and are life. Meaning, I wasn't saying for you to drink my actual blood or eat my actual flesh. The words I speak are spirit and are life. And so I'm just saying that, that there's a lot of you that think that you're, you are in an impossible battle that you're facing an, an impossible addiction. You're, pace, you're, you're facing an impossible giant. The truth is, as long as you remain in the atmosphere you're in, it's going to continue to appear, if, appear impossible. I don't know if you guys are understanding what I'm saying. This is why the Bible says, it says, bad company corrupts good habits. Why? It doesn't say a bad person. It says bad company. Because the Bible says two are better than one and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Meaning, when you have two or three, now there's an atmosphere. And we're going to go ahead and, 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 and get into this. Yeah, yeah, so this is the enemy is playing. I don't want to get too profound, but if you could follow me, the enemy is playing a game of illusions. It's a game of illusions. And you're going to lose if you're not in the spirit. And when I say that, I mean, you know, when you point, there's three fingers pointed to you and one pointed to God. You know, well, God can never lose them. You know, <laughs> God can never lose them. I'm going to, you know, like all of us, if we're not in the spirit, because he's good at playing the game of illusions, he's going to use circumstances to say, you see, you're a reject. You see, you're never going to be able to walk with God. You see all that talk of fire. <laughs> I know who you really are. You see, I'm waiting for you in your room with the computer. Go ahead and praise. You see, I know what's going on. Let's talk because I know the real you. When the devil can never know the real you, the devil doesn't even know himself fully. Only God, only God knows the real you. Only God knows what you are predestined for. He's your creator. We have to go to him to understand us. And so Matthew, we, we all know, you guys just write it down. Matthew 18, uh, um, chapter 18, verse 20. Where two or more are gathered, I am in the midst of them. Where two or more are gathered in my name. Very key. Right? Matthew 18 to 20. I mean, 18, chapter 18, verse 20. Where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. I am in the midst of them. Th those of you here tonight, I, 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 if, you, if you stick with me, I believe you're going to get something from God in this, in this teaching tonight. I believe that. Because it's just, there's, there's some stuff that, there's some stuff that could be, you know, you know how it is. There's some stuff that maybe is us, and there's some stuff that is from God. And so 
There, I believe the Lord is preparing many of us. And so revelation is caught, not taught, right? It's, it, it comes from a, a revelation is understood from the heart, not the mind. It's the willingness to, to desire God, the willingness to obey. And so where two or more are gathered in my name, I am in the midst. What is that? What does that mean? So if, if we're together and we're hanging out, that's cool. We're blessed, you know, but it's, it's until we're in his name. What does that mean in his name? There's something that we're doing that is his will. Maybe we begin talking about the word of God. Maybe we begin talking about a prophetic dream. Maybe we begin to pray or maybe or whatever it is. There's a point where it's no longer just us hanging out and, 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 and there's a hunger for God inside of him, inside of her. And there's a hunger for God inside of me. So so now we're inviting God through hunger. Sometimes you don't even have to invi invite God through words. You just invite him through your hunger. Amen. Because hunger for God is willingness to change. So then, so then what happens is you're in his name once you desire his will. He said, I'm in the midst of them. That means he shows up. What does that do? Change the atmosphere. Amen. So he's saying where two or more are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst. When the atmosphere shifts, when the atmosphere of heaven is established, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatever you release on earth. Would... It's not just all the time. It's, it's get in my name. Get in my will. And, and I'm not saying that, that we don't strive for acceptance. Understand this. But the Bible does teach we have to pay a price for his presence. There's a difference, and the balance is not often taught. It says, those that diligently seek me, find me. Right? When he says, draw close to God, and he will draw close to you. He's talking to believers that have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Why, if you're living inside of me, do I have to draw close? Because the distance between me and God is the intention of my heart. Because if God, if the Holy Spirit being inside of me just means right away, I'm just going to remain intimate in the manifested presence of God. That means that now he controls my will. And this is something very mysterious. God never, ever, ever controls your will. In fact, your purpose and your calling is often fulfilled by what in the kingdom of God you choose to target. We're gonna, I'm going to get ahead of myself. What do I mean by that? Elisha said, I want double the mantle of Elijah. I want double your mantle. Amen. And then Elijah said, nah, you've asked a hard thing. You've asked a hard thing. And he goes, well, if you stay with me until I go and the father takes me, then, then you will have it. But if you look away, you will not. And so there were many opportunities for Elisha where he, the Bible says that they were passed by the school of prophets. And then Elijah Jah, I said, Elijah, would say, stay here, stay here, giving him an opportunity. Look, a school of prophets, you want the anointing? There's the anointing. Go ahead, giving him the opportunity. You want the gift? There's the gift. But see, if you want the character, then there's a process. And so what happens is Elisha targeted the double, meaning, I, I don't know if I'm explaining myself well, meaning I'm willing to go through the necessary process. When Jesus told Martha, 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 you are worried and distracted because of much serving that has chosen the best part, the one part that won't be taken from her. It, it doesn't mean, okay, she figured it out. It's over. Mary's awesome. That's great. Let's all applaud Mary. You did it, Mary. Yay. No, no, no. It means Mary chose to target. Mary chose to pursue the best part. So her heart from that moment on was always in pursuit of worshiping, of loving, of being loved by, of knowing him, of pleasing him, of obeying him and honoring him. So the first one he reveals himself to is Mary. Hey, Amen. it's me. Amen. We did it. Amen. He did it, but he includes us. Amen. Go call my disciples. Because you love me so much, you don't even need to be called my disciple. You love me so much, you're not even looking for a title. You're not looking for public acknowledgement. Amen. How do I know that? Because when she broke the alabaster box, she made, and, she, and the Bible actually says she cleaned his feet from behind his feet. Not even in front, like I'm not even worthy. And she used what the Bible calls the, the hair of a woman is her glory. Meaning she didn't just give her perfume, she gave her personal glory. She gave everything she had for herself and kept nothing that she had for herself. Amen. 
And, while, and, the, and then the disciples didn't want to do that. Why? They don't want to be a public fool. Because Jesus rebuked them and said, you, when I came, you, haven't, you didn't even give me a kiss. They wanted to be seen with Jesus. They wanted, they wanted the, the, and so Mary didn't even care. So he's like, okay, go get them. Because I know, I know where your state is, right? And so she chose, I want you to understand, what you choose to pursue in God is, is what he's going to continue to do in your life. He's responding to your choice. It isn't just like a calling and he pu pulled names out of a hat and it's just a calling and he's just going to do it. And, and, and yes, there are promises that he's going to do. Yes, God is gracious. Don't misunderstand me. But let me ask you a question. Do you want to be loved by someone because they choose to love you that way? Or do you want to be loved by someone just because it's an arranged marriage and they're supposed to love you? And since they know they're supposed to love you, that's what they got to do. Oh, okay. You know why? Because you're made in the image of God. Guess who else wants that? The one that made you in his image. Amen. And so what happens is, is, is you want someone to love you out of a choice, out of a decision. And here's the thing. When somebody loves you, there are people that could say, you know, I, I love you and, I, and, 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 and you know, I love you and I'm here for you and I'll serve you. But there's other people that say, I love you and I care. Not only about what you feel, but why you feel that. That's what Mary did. And so she targeted that. And what, why am I saying this? Because when you target that, you give God legal right to take you through that process. And when he takes you through that process, there's a different weight. And so this is why the Bible says some multiply 30, some 60, some 100 fold. It's not all the same because not everyone targets the same thing from God. Not everyone says, I want to know him with all my heart. Some people say, I want to be used powerfully. Some people just say, I want to be, I want, I want God use me. And that's what they want. But some people say, I don't care if I'm known. I want to know you. And so this is what God works, and this is what he operates. And so, and so he's saying, when you are in my name, I change the atmosphere. And so we have to be careful. Half the battle, if I may say it like that, or maybe not half, but a large part of the battle that you're in has to do with atmospheres. Understand that I'm quoting the Bible. It has to do with atmospheres. Jesus was with a man and said, at that point, no one has a, had, a, had ascended to heaven. They went to paradise. He says, no one, had a, no one has ascended into heaven except the Son of Man that has descended from heaven, who is in heaven. Meaning, I'm talking to you, but we're in different atmospheres. And this is why when he shows up, the demons manifest. Because the kingdom of God, the atmosphere of the kingdom of God that destroys the kingdom of darkness just showed up. So it, it may as well have been an army that pulled up on them. So let's read Colossians 2.15. He, he disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. That's the ESV. The NIV says, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. This talks about when Jesus forgave us of, of, of our sins. What he did here is in the spiritual world, and I don't even know, there has to be more than billions. There has to be trillions and trillions and trillions of angels, which is another story. In the spiritual world, he made a public spectacle of Satan, meaning he embarrassed Satan in front of all the demons. That's what it says. He embarrassed the devil because he removed the power that made him so treacherous. And so this is why the Bible says that when the Antichrist comes, he will have power over everyone except the names that are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And the question is, how does he know whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life? You remember when the man was casting out demons and he told the demon, I cast you out in the name of the, of the Jesus Paul preaches. The demons in the person said, Jesus we know, Paul we know, but who are you? And through the person, they beat him up and, and left him naked. Because they know whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And so, and so what happens is he disarmed the devil. Why am I saying all of this? We read in the book of Pentecost, I mean the book of Acts, I'm sorry, where in Pentecost, 120 were in the upper room, and they were praying together, and the Bible says, and a rushing wind came in, right? And the fire of God rested on people's heads. Every principality and every ruler. What does that mean? It means he just removed the obstacle between heaven and earth. How did the power of God come so strong that people were becoming like Jesus 
to the point that Stephen was being stoned to death and said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. How were people, how did 3,000 get saved in one moment? Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Why? Because someone say atmosphere. atmosphere. The kingdom of God, Jesus had just disarmed. That's why the New Testament says, and the devil was releasing new demons. Because he was trying to create a new atmospherical block between heaven and earth. Okay, well, well, uh, what are you talking about? The book of Daniel. The angel comes to Daniel. And he says, as soon as you made a decision to obey in your heart, your prayer was answered. The princes of Persia, they held me back. The atmosphere that was over Persia delayed the breakthrough. Are you guys hearing me? Some of you, your breakthrough is actually on the way to you. Some of you, the victory is actually on the way. The change is actually on the way. But what happens is the atmosphere, there's a demonic atmosphere blocking the breakthrough. And so are you going to press in further or are you going to believe the lie? And so this is what's happening. And this is why, why the, the, uh, uh, the Lord has ministered to me and what he has shown me. It doesn't allow me to get discouraged. Because when you understand what's happening in the spiritual world, you, you're not affected as much by the natural world. We're often too affected by people. We're too affected by situations. We're highly situational. We're affected by comments on social media with people that we don't know that were probably on the toilet while they wrote it. And you're like super offended. And it's like, the guy who's on the toilet has a lot of time that he shouldn't have. Don't worry about it. You know, <laughs> and, we're, and, and, and we're super affected you know, it's probably like someone's 17 and they put a picture like they're 32 and it's like a seven, he's trolling you and you're, you're, you're mad. <laughs> so what happens is that, that we're super affected by natural things. Hello? Let me just say it like this. The more in the spirit you are automatically, the less you're affected by natural things. The more you're not in the spirit, the more the enemy can use natural things. So if, if you can understand, oh, okay, the reason they're setting me up to be fired at work is because... I just was used by God to cast out these demons. As a matter of fact, since God just used me to cast out these demons, let me go ahead and pray because <laughs> eight times out of ten. So you be, when you become spiritually minded, you become like Apostle Paul, who was, I believe, Satan's worst nightmare. Because Apostle Paul would build himself up on trials. When, 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 when he was shipwrecked, and, and he almost died, and, and then he goes to, it's cold, he goes to warm his hands, a snake jumps out and, and bites him. Beautiful story, we could watch it, maybe in animation. If that happened to you, you're gonna flip out. If a snake bites you, you and me are gonna be like, oh no, I'm dying, I can feel myself dying. Oh, my soul, I left my body. Push my soul back in, push my soul. <laughs> Apostle Paul said, bring the sick people, ah, uh, oh. <laughs> He didn't even rebuke the, the snake. He said he just shook it off. Because there's a moment that you shouldn't give the devil the attention he wants. Wow. Yes, and, the, and, the, and the devil is wanting you to, to, to backbite. He's wanting you to respond back. He's wanting you to say, oh, let, 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 let me find out. He's, he, he, he's wanting you to do these things, and he's loving it. He's loving it. Yes, yes, I'm destroying flesh by themselves. I get them to destroy themselves. He's loving it like a puppet master. And we think we proved something. Yeah, that's right. I told them. No, you were used as a puppet. And so if we're in the spirit, we understand. I don't want the enemy to be able to use me the way he wants to use me. I don't want, I don't want to be part of this. This is something that God showed me years ago. If, if, if you give in to violence and you give in to confrontation, you could be empowering the darkness the devil has been operating in that person. And that changed my view about a lot of things. Because in the culture I grew up with, you have to. And so, and so these are things where the enemy is using culture. He's using the people around you. He's using the circumstances. But if you see in the spirit, you're not shaken. Because not only do you see what the enemy's trying to do, you also can see the reward for not doing what the enemy wants you to do. And then you have the upper hand. And so Apostle Paul knew, oh, okay, the devil wants me to, he wants attention. He wants me to get despaired. Hmm, how do I say it? There are things that God has for you that currently appears like it's not going to happen. It's the enemy's job to make it seem like it's not going to happen. I don't know if you guys are understanding what I'm saying. It's the enemy's job to use the atmosphere, to use the people closest to you, 
to use your family, especially when there's a breakthrough. He'll have somebody, he'll stir something up that's a misunderstanding, that's not even based on truth, so that when you get home after you got filled with the Holy Spirit, the enemy has a plan to get you right back in the flesh. And so if you're seeing in the spirit, you already know, I know what's coming. And I know, see here in the natural, it looked like Jesus got defeated. It looked like Jesus got whooped. It was Jesus that was spit on. It was Jesus that was slapped, disrespected, put on a cross. But by not giving in and not using his power, he told Peter, don't you know I can call six legions of angels right now? I don't need your knife. You know, he, he, he actually told Pontius Pilate, if my kingdom was of this world, we would fight. Why would a pacifist say something like that? Everybody has Jesus looking like a pacifist, like he's a hippie, like, no, 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 no. He made it clear, like, understand, you are not my enemy. But if you were, you are not my enemy. Why say that? And so what happens is he understood, I take down the enemy, the Roman Empire is going to fall. So he understood that, that, that this is where the real fight is. And so when he resisted, when he resisted fighting back with flesh, he was destroying the devil because that's his strength. His strength is to get you caught up in conflict, to get you caught up in the argument, to get you caught up in, 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 in the confusion. He, he wants to get you caught up in these things. But when you're in the spirit, you understand, okay, it confirms your calling. It confirms your anointing. It confirms you did something good. It confirms that you're growing spiritually. It confirms that your prayers are being answered. It doesn't do the opposite. But what happens is we have to get out of the natural. And so some of you, you have an atmosphere in your, in your house that is waiting. My, my first mentor uh, taught me this, who is really my only mentor until the mentors we have now, which are awesome. And he taught me this. He said, when you're in a house with other people that are in sin, pray and say, God, they have no legal right to touch me because I'm not participating in their sin. And so sometimes there's things happening and the enemy is using, the, why am I saying all of this? Change your atmospheres and half your battles will decrease. Amen. Amen. Nowadays, the celebrities are telling you who they are. Believe people when they tell you who they are. Amen. They're telling you, yes, I worship the devil. <laughs> and you're like, oh, they're silly. <laughs> I'm going to go to the concert. I'm just going to pray in tongues. And then you don't, you, you, you don't perceive what's happening. They're telling you who they are. So if you want to get closer to God, remove yourself from the atmosphere that is making war with God. There are certain movies, there's certain music that comes with an atmosphere. H have you ever watched a movie, you turn it off, you feel an atmosphere in your room? Can you be honest? The truth is all of us have. By, by the lack of, of hands, I got confirmation. How, how, how many of us? Turn a movie on, you turn it off, there's an atmosphere there. So, so there are certain atmospheres that you could be slicing the warfare in half. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what the Lord showed me? Do not worry about what your eyes see or what they don't. Because you're not worrying over simply a church. You are bringing an atmosphere. This isn't about a church. It's about, it's about an atmosphere. It's about the kingdom of heaven. It's about knowing the living God. We could play church if we want. I, uh, this is what Elijah told Elisha. You've asked a hard thing. And this is one of the things that the Lord confirmed to me. You've asked a hard thing. That there are things in your, in your life that God is, wants to disarm. There are things that have been against you. There, there's warfare that has been against you that has seemed a lot harder than it really is. There's rejection that you've gone through that has been a lot. There's, there are things that that is not, that's not the reality and that's not the truth. But you have to understand that the enemy is going to use whatever he can so that he can put you in a place where you believe the lie. Because he wants me and you to believe the lie. He wants to, 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 to do something where we're praying and praying and praying and evangelizing and evangelizing for six months. And we don't see one person come to Christ. So the enemy's like, you should just stop. But see, if you see in the spirit more than you see in the natural. This is why God told the prophet Jeremiah, do not look at their faces. He said, deliver my word, do not look at their faces. In other words, don't worry about the reaction of the people. This is the thing. This is why God has to take you through a process. Listen, we're going somewhere. He has to take you through a process of intimacy with him so that, so that your identity and your self-esteem is not affected by people. Because even though you carry a strong anointing, if you need people's approval, the enemy will know that. 
If you're affected by their acceptance, the enemy will know that. If you're accepted by their rejection, the enemy will know that. And then he will use it as a weapon. But when he sees that you're dead, see a dead, I've heard, I don't know what man of God I heard say this, a dead man doesn't respond. You kick their body, they don't respond. The enemy will see, I brought the offense, you didn't respond. I brought the confusion, they didn't respond. I sent a snake to bite Paul. He, 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 he turned it into a miracle crusade. Let's not do that again. Bring the demons. Look, not, not again. Let's not do the whole crashing on an island. Yeah, that's not. No, no. We're not doing that again. So what happens is you can make the enemy. I, I remember there was this man of God that told me that he was going through this financial stuff back to back, back to back, back to back. And he had um, these disciples, right, in the church, like maybe 20, right, disciples that had disciples. And he was getting financially bashed for like two weeks, he said, or something like that. It was really crazy. And he goes, so you know what I said? Satan, I'm going to get revenge. And he called all his disciples. We're evangelizing every day now. Wow. And the finances broke through and everything broke through for him. Because, because the enemy wanted him to drown. The enemy wants to, this is why the Bible says the devil is like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. It's okay. Listen to me now. It's okay that you don't see the breakthrough that you want yet. It's okay that you don't see the change yet. It's okay that things don't look like what God put in your spirit. It's okay because the fact that you're, that you're pushing and you're believing and you're praying, it means that you're on the way. In fact, I might even go as, as be as bold as to say this. The fact that it doesn't look like, that it actually looks less like the breakthrough than it should, should be confirmation that you've been doing good things in the spirit. It should be confirmation that you're on your way to breakthrough. I don't know if you guys are understanding what... Ah. He disarmed principalities. Don't trust demons to tell you the truth. Ah. Don't trust demons to tell you the truth. What does that mean? <laughs> well, I've done it. Not knowing. When I felt anxiety, and I've let the anxiety control a little bit of my thinking. I've done it. Maybe you guys haven't and you guys could pray for me after. <sighs> when we let the fear speak to us. And you know, fear is demonic faith. Because you're imagining something that hasn't happened yet. And so, and so I've done it. That we allow the, the, the fear and the worry and the things and what you're doing and what I was doing is thinking that the demons are telling me the truth. Thinking that the demon of fear is telling me the truth. Oh, there's something true about that demon. Really, demon of fear, tell me more. Well, what's going to happen is, ha, 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 you know, hey, there's all kinds of crazy things happening in the streets, so, yeah, you might not make it, you know. Oh, really? Oh, what else? See, we, 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 we listen to the fear because we think that, oh, if I listen more, I'll be more safe. If I pay attention to, I know my mom used to do that all the time. I would say, mom, why are you, my mom loved to worry. I'm like, mom, why do you want to worry? And she's like, because, because I'm a realist, I'm a realist. I'm realistic, I'm realistic. You're not realistic. My mom is born and raised in New York, so you, yeah. I'm realistic, you don't know what you're talking about. You're not educated, I'm realistic. And she would just love to do that. You know, what, another thing, I didn't even tell you this, mama, that when I was on the phone with my mom, I got extreme breakthrough with my mom. I mean, I was to the point that I was crying. My mom prayed with me on the phone and I was crying. Why? Because my mom was my worst persecutor. Day and night, my mom was my worst persecutor. I never thought. I, you know, humanly, I didn't think she was going to get saved. And now she's radically saved. You know what she told me on the phone? She used to call me always panicking that she's going to be sick with something all the time. My mom was what they call a hypochondriac. I'm like, this is going to happen. I'm going to, oh my gosh. I'm gonna, you know, always thinking she's sick. Now she says, you know what happens now? I don't know how. I get symptoms. And as soon as I go to the doctor, they're gone. Wow. Because I prayed. I prayed, God, you use me. And Father, and it's a privilege but I just pray that you would honor me with my mother. Wow. I lost my father. He's with you. I just pray you honor me with my mother. Amen. And so she was praying with me on the phone and I couldn't help from crying because my mom never sounds so saved in my life. She was saying, Lord, forgive me for not prioritizing spending time with you. In my mind, I'm like, what? You don't understand how difficult that was. Amen. And so the enemy made it seem like my mother was not going to get saved. You have to understand, this is what he does. This is what he does. And it's basically, are, do you really believe that conviction more than you believe the proof? Because I'm going to give you proof. I'm going to give you proof over and over. And every time you sin, I got more proof. Look at this. Look at that. Let's talk. And then, and then he gets you into a place where you're paying attention. You see, it's the proof. I told you, you're never going to. It's confirmation. He's terrified that you might not listen to him. Why is the devil talking if there isn't something to steal? 
Why is he telling you you're not going to make it? If he doesn't fear, you're going to. And so don't trust demons to tell you the truth. We trust demons to tell us the truth. Yeah. Yeah, when we feel the fear, when we feel the worry, and we feel the anxiety, there's some truth in that. Let me pay attention. Stop going to demons to tell you the truth. They're not telling you the truth. It doesn't matter how real the fear feels. It doesn't matter. And I've gone through this. Listen, I have, I have real clinical diagnoses. You know, the, you know like, like I've gone through these things. I'm not, I'm not minimizing any of it. Don't misunderstand that. I would not do that. I'm just saying... Don't, don't allow the enemy, don't think, no matter how bad you feel the fear, no matter how fat, bad you feel the loneliness, no matter how bad you feel the depression, no matter how bad you feel the discouragement, it's not the truth. And it's not telling you the truth. When are you going to make a decision to grow up in the spirit? How long is it going to be that you're going to remain a spiritual child that doesn't know how to stand up on their own, that doesn't know how to walk on their own? We're almost there. We're almost there. Yes. Yes, Lord. So this are the, these are the things that the atmosphere tries to get you to believe, right? It tries to get you to believe you're never going to be enough or do enough to encounter God's presence. You're never going to be enough or do enough to encounter God's presence. It's the funniest thing because, yes, we have to pay a price for his presence, but it's like sometimes the, the price is just getting your heart right. That's it. It's just... It's just how many here have had an encounter with God right after you sinned? I have. Why? Because in that moment, we're finally humble. In that moment, we're like, Lord, I can't without you. So then God's able to show up. When the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, you know what that means? Someone poor doesn't have options. Someone poor has no choice. I don't have options. If this is what it is, this is what it is. Someone poor in spirit. So when you're poor in spirit, what does that mean? Spiritually, God, I need you. At 8 a.m., 9 a.m., 10 a.m., when I wake up, I need you. In the morning, I need you. In the after Lord, I need you. Lord, when, 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 when things don't go good at work, I need you. You know how many times at work and in college, I would go to the bathroom and pray? And, and I didn't know some people would hear me, and then it was embarrassing, but that's another story. But I would go to the bathroom, and more than once, I went to the bathroom. And I just put my hands together by the grace of the living God and his presence fell. Because, why, oh, that's because you're special. No, that's because I'm needy. Oh, you know what? What you're special, I'm needy. Oh, you're special. No, I'm fragile. And I know I'm fragile. And I know without God, I can't do it. And I know without God, my heart breaks. I know without God, I don't feel the same. I know without God, I can't deal with the issues. I need him. I'm needy. That's what it is to be poor in spirit. Oh, you're just, oh, you're always talking about your encounters. Well, maybe you need to get more needy. Maybe, maybe, maybe you think you don't need him. You kind of do sometimes. So this is what it tells you. You're never going to be able to live in holiness. First of all, we can't live in holiness without the Holy One. He's the one that lives in holiness through you. He's the one that changes your palate. He took the palate. I had a palate to curse every other word. I had a palate to make fun of people. I was really good at it. I had a palate to do these things. My family's from New York. It's like you have to from your kid because you're getting whooped by everybody with, with, the, with, the, with the roasting, you know? I had, I had a palate. I had a palate for these things. God, God changed the taste in my mouth. So it doesn't feel good now. It doesn't feel good when, when, when I, out, I, I out troll somebody. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. He changed. Only he can change your desires. We can't do it without him. Understand, this is why he told Peter, Peter, let me go. It's a benefit to you that I go. Because if I go, then I give you the Holy Spirit. I give you the helper. You, don't, you, need, you need the Holy Spirit to make you like me. And so what we do is we're like, Peter, no, don't go. Because when Jesus would speak, that's when they would have encounters. But he's saying, but now it's going to be greater because it's not just when I speak. Now you're going to carry the encounter. Wow. And so what happens is God is just waiting for our heart to shift. Does this make sense? It's not as hard as we think it is. It gets a lot easier when our heart gets aligned to do that. You're never going to be enough to, to get in his presence. God, God made it clear to me, I'm always waiting for you. What do you say? I'm always waiting. 
I am your loving father. If you can believe I am your loving father, I am your friend, then you will encounter me if you can believe that. Why? Because what you believe determines your actions. Um, you're never going to be able to fulfill your calling or your purpose. Another thing, if it's possible for you and your own strength, it's not God. If what you think your purpose is is possible for you, it's not God. God is attracted to the impossible wow. because then he's glorified as God. There are things that, and this is why I'm encouraged, and this is part of why I'm encouraged, and part of why I'm stirred up, because the Lord is showing me, listen, the enemy is playing his illusion game again. The enemy is coming to town with Cirque du Soleil. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. Understand what the enemy is doing, and it's because you're punching a hole in the atmosphere, so he has to make you think that things are not shifting. It's a war of atmospheres. It's a clash of kingdoms. I don't know if you guys are understanding what I'm saying. Listen, listen, the, the, the enemy is not not going to violently fight somebody he could practice diplomacy with not to get hyper militaristic but you know in how, how two countries go to war once diplomacy no longer works I don't know if you guys caught that the enemy's not going to war with men and women that proclaim his name but he could practice diplomacy with them okay fine you could preach but after you do here you go you, you can preach but you do it for the money second you could preach, but you got to lie on that sheet. And then, don't worry, I don't, there's not that much warfare, a little bit here and there. You could preach, but, but when it's straight up, no negotiation, devil. <laughs> now, now, it's a little bit different. You're never going to be able to fulfill your purpose. Another lie from the devil. Listen, if you're hearing these things, it's confirmation that you're on your way. If you've heard these things in your mind, in your emotions, it's confirmation. You're doing something. Keep doing what you're doing. What is it? I started going to church again. Keep doing that. I started praying. Keep doing that. Yeah, I started, I, 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 I fasted. Keep doing that. Whatever it is, the reason you're starting to hear that is because there's something that you're, you're embarking on. There's something that is breaking through that hasn't happened before. And so what happens is when you become, when you just trust the Lord, when once your trust gets into a place that it's like, you know what, God, I worship you and I trust you. And it doesn't matter how I feel or, or what I see or what it looks like. I'm just going to trust you. When you get like that, once you get like that, it's only a matter of time where the dam breaks because the enemy knows, listen, it doesn't matter what I throw at them. They're not going to believe the lie. So, so I have no reason to hold it back anymore. Another thing that gets us is people are going to reject me and hate me. How many of us have held back a prophetic word? I've done it, so maybe this could be confession time, okay? It's confession time. How many of us have held back a prophetic word, held back a prayer for someone? Maybe you just felt to call someone and just pray for them on the phone. How many of us have held, they're going to hate me. They're going to dislike me. They're going to think I'm too much of a fanatic. They're going to think I'm too crazy. Especially nowadays that because of social media, where the Bible says they will find for themselves teachers that tell their itching ears what they want to hear. Now anybody can go on social media and find someone that teaches whatever they like. <laughs> and so now it's even more challenging. They go online and they're like, yeah, you know, they find the, the, what their itching ears want to hear. I don't know, but this person says, you know what, fornication really isn't. It just is fornication. What does that really mean, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. You can find someone that says whatever, whatever it is that you want them to hear. This is, the, this is how deception has increased. And so I said this before, where deception increases, we think, oh, no, but these people, they're Christians, and they're smoking out. These people, they're Christians, and they have a marijuana business. No, what happens when deception increases, it doesn't mean it does, what you think is more comfort is actually less protection. Because now there's more deception. And so now it's more challenging. I don't know if you guys are catching what I'm saying. And so we have to draw close to God for him to reveal the truth. And so people are going to reject me. This is what happens that it's happened to me. Another thing that we're going to battle in our walk, and we're almost done, is the fear of man. And what do I mean the fear of man? Man, if I give this word, if I talk about holiness, because that's forbidden in the church now. You can't talk about holiness. That's why wow, that's so bad. If I talk about holiness, oh, no. Oh, no, you can't, you know, there, people are going to get mad. So I'm just not going to talk about holiness. And that's how a lot of Christians are now, that because we hear with the ears of servants and we don't hear with the ear of a son and a daughter. See, when you hear with the ear of a son and a daughter and you know that your father is talking to you, you know everything that you're hearing is for your benefit, your enrichment, your enrichment, your empowerment and your protection. Because, of course, I'm his son. 
Everything he tells me is to make me stronger, more powerful, more successful. When you hear, well, like a son and a daughter. But when you hear like a servant, you get offended. And so that's where we have the church right now. And so when it's like, man, let me pray for this person or let me give them a word. No, they're not going to, they're going to hate me. They're not going to want, they're not going to, they're not going to want to be around me. And we are all going to face the challenge of the fear of man. We're going to face the challenge of the fear of man. And here's the beautiful thing. The more, have you seen it? The more in the spirit you are, the less self-preserving you are. It's, it's the more on fire for God you are. When God tells you to speak to this person, the less you think about it. The, the more on fire, for, the more you're spending time with God and God says, call this person, pray for them, the less you think about it. The more you're on fire for, for God, it's easy to tell somebody a difficult truth with love. Because the truth is, it's because I love you. See, we think that people that tell us what we want to hear love us. But the Bible says, with flattery, an enemy destroys you. Yeah. They'll tickle your ego so that they could be, they could be seen as your friend. Because they're not going to sacrifice their popularity with you to tell you a hard truth. And this is why it's so easy to make the person telling the truth look like the bad person. Yeah. It's so easy to set the person up that has the right heart. Because a narcissist can always see it from a distance. And say, see, I tell you, I, I support you. I support your dreams. Yeah, you could go to church and, and practice the universal law. That's ridiculous. Meanwhile, this person doesn't care. But the Bible says, with flattery word, flattering words, an enemy deceives you, uh, destroys you. But it says, but the wounds of a friend are faithful. Someone that loves you, tells you, man, you might be upset with me. Man, but I care about where you're going to be in three months. I care. It affects me. When someone loves you, it affects them what happens to you. If, if what happens to you doesn't affect them, they don't love you. It's a relationship of convenience. Uh, 2 Corinthians 9, 10. Uh, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You may be encircled in every way so that you could be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Listen, I'm going to repeat this. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your seed. Check this out. The enemy is always going to tell us what we don't have, but the Bible says, give what you don't have, and that's how I give you more. I give seed to the sower. It doesn't say, let him who has seed sow. It says, I give seed to the sower. Perfect example, David. Told the people of God and told Goliath what he was going to do, didn't even bring the rocks. Why am I saying this? You want anointing in prayer and in intercession? Intercede. He's going to give seed to the sower. You want revelation? Read the word. Share it with someone. The Bible says whatever you receive in private, private, shout from the rooftops. These are keys I've lived. I know the benefit of it, not just the rumor. Anointing, evangelize. He gives seed to the sower. You want, you want, how do you grow an anointing? Do it. Anointing is so God can empower you to be used by him. If, if you're not being used, what's the point of anointing? Now, we know anointing is not the beginning and the end. Knowing him is. But he gives seed to the sower. Why am I saying this? Because the enemy is going to make you focus. We're almost done here. On what you don't have. You don't have holiness. That's why I sow prayer. You don't have. You lack love. That's why I sow worship. And I sow prayer. And I sow fasting. Because he is love. And he increases my love. And it's okay that I'm not there yet. And it's okay that I'm not in the place that I want to be. It's okay because he gives seed to the sower. And he's faithful. And he's faithful. And he's faithful even when I'm faithless. So it's okay. It's okay because as long as I don't give up. And as long as I continue to go after him. He's going to give me new seed. As long. As long as I. And here's the beauty about God. Even when you're in your worst. And you go and you pray for someone else. In your worst state. He's going to give you he's going to provide for you because the bible says they says he who waters shall be watered himself so when you stop having a mentality of i don't have enough knowledge of the bible to be able to share a word when you stop with the mentality i don't have a, enough a prayer life to be able to preach the gospel when you stop with the mentality then you're going to grow because he is going to give you seed while you step out wow. let's say it this way He's never going to let you step out by faith and leave you ashamed. Yeah. He's never going to let you step out. Someone say a key, a key. to growth. Sure. Give what you don't have. Wow. I heard someone say it like this also. You get to keep what you give away. 
That's what you get to keep. <laughs> in other words, your reward is going to be in heaven. It's forever. You keep what you give away. You think that you sold money, you sold prayer, you sold, you sold time, and you think it went nowhere? Impossible. God is not a liar. He's not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. I don't know if this is not. The Bible says, I will never forget the service that you served in my name. When God says never, he means never. There are things that you prayed that God hasn't forgotten and that he's planning to answer. There's things that you sowed that you forgot he didn't forget. I don't know if you guys are. God, is someone say he's faithful. And so here's the thing, I want to give, um, I want to give proof for Isaiah 40, 31, because many know Isaiah 40, 31, and then we're going to pray. And I just want to give, I want to give more Bible, biblical proof on that. Isaiah 40, 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They, they, they shall mount up on, with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. If you have been feeling tired. Hello, if you have been feeling tired, spiritually, spiritually tired, hello, if you have been feeling spiritually tired, don't give up, don't give up, because he's about to put air under your wings, and when he puts the air, he's going to show you, hey, I gave you wings, I'm going to prove it, biblically. So what happens is, why would he say, but those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength? Why would he have to renew your strength? Because there's a, pr a price that you pay in the natural, and he does the supernatural. He's saying, you did some natural things, and you got tired. Maybe you forgave people, they betrayed you again. Maybe you gave up a relationship, and you feel more depressed than ever. Maybe you've been going and seeking God, and you don't feel his presence. And maybe you've been, don't give up, because those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. It's, it's only a matter of time. I've lived it on more than one occasion that it's a moment where my hands drop. It's a moment where it's hard. And it's a moment where I'm overwhelmed. And all of a sudden, God just comes through. And a lot of times in ways, I don't see it. My wife and I, for example, I don't know, was it three months ago? We went to the conference. Some of you guys went. I think it was Jesus 24. And the first day was powerful. And the second day, um, it, it, it was good. But I, I wanted more. I was hungry for more. And I went. And I think the most powerful thing I received was from two women sitting next to me. And this woman prayed for me, and it was such a prophetic prayer that it was even strategy and details about what God is doing in LA. Wow. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy. And, and it's like the person sitting next to me. By the way, I, I should have been up in the rafter somewhere. I got that seat because um, I, I, I saw a friend that I knew from the church that we were part of in Miami, and he happened to be serving there, and he was like, look, you know, let me know. And we sat there, this woman, why am I saying this? Because God is going to bring the breakthrough and the victory in a moment, and in a way, you don't perceive it. This is what we were talking about the other day, that God comes to people when they're doing something. Why is that? He comes to Peter when he's fishing. He actually reveals who he is with the fishing. Oh, look, go put the, you know, why? He, 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 he comes to Matthew when he's working the tax collecting. He comes to, to uh, this happens over and over, even, even when Elijah came to Elisha, he was working for his father. And why, why is this? Because he wants to come when you're not looking for it. He wants to come, he's gonna bring your husband, your wife, your breakthrough, the breakthrough in the marriage you already have, the finances, when, when you're like, Lord, I'm just gonna trust you. Why? Because then he can do it his way. Because if you're paying attention, you get in the way. When I'm paying attention, me, Peter, I get in the way. We get in the way. And so here I'm going to show you. Exodus 19.4. Read these fast. It's only two scriptures. Exodus 19.4. You yourselves, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Well, I don't, they, they, I didn't see, I don't remember in the Bible the giant eagle that carried the Jews on, the, on his wings. I don't remember that. I, I, I remember the parting of the sea, but I don't remember a giant eagle. 
But he says, I, I bore you on eagle's wings and brought you. <laughs> what does that mean? It's obviously symbolic speech. It's saying, it's saying, I changed your situation so fast. It's like I swooped in and carried you out. By the grace of God, I've lived this. We're talking about what we live. We're not talking about interesting theology. We're talking about what we live. We talk, when I was mentally ill, the doctors told me, that's it, you're done at 17, that's it. This is your life. Heavily medicated, that's, that's it, you're legally disabled. The Lord swooped in like eagle's wings, delivered me, healed me, I don't even know how. He did it over and over again, I was depressed, wanted to commit suicide. God came in, delivered me, changed it, I don't know how. The first year I was saved, I would battle with being angry at God. God spoke to me, ministered to me, opened my eyes, made me make sure it was him, took it away. I repented, never went back. I don't even fully know how. See, does this make sense to anyone? You're, you're, you're praying and you're like, am I ever going to get strong in prayer? You're worshiping and you're like, am I ever going to get strong in worship? You're, you're reading the Bible. Am I ever going to understand the Bible? And I understand that maybe some of you hear me and you get frustrated. It's not, it's not, God doesn't have favorites. It's provoking. You, you know why God will put someone? It's because he loves you so much. He wishes that you would become jealous and desire it and have it too. Amen. Well, how do I know that? The Bible says that he's using the Gentiles to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Right. Yes, he it isn't that God wants to display something and say, and say oh, you see, ha ha. No, he's saying, I, I want you. Yeah, they're great and everything, but they can't replace you. Amen. I want you. Amen. And so what happens is, if you've been feeling like, man, I, get, I, I go, Lord, am I ever going to get strong in worship? Lord, am I ever going to get strong in soul winning? Am I ever going to get strong in knowing your word? I remember I had a friend that would do that, and I would feel like that, like provoked, like, Lord, why don't you do that with me? Like, he would tell me, yeah, every time I open the Bible, the presence of God falls. I'm like, every time? I'm like, what is that, bro? Every time? And, and for real, he will quote things in the Bible, and I'm like, where did you get that from? Like, we were mad young, too. He was like 21, and I'm like, yo, like, where, did you, where did you get this from, bro? You know, and he, and he would say things, oh, because the Bible says nothing is unclean of itself. It says that? Like, he, 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 there was this girl that convinced me that I did not like. I did not like her. It was the first year I would say that. She was my wife, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm going to have to marry this girl. This is horrible. God doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't force you. And he showed me the Bible. He's like, look, James chapter 3, the, the wisdom from heaven, from above, is pure, gentle, willing to yield. God will never force you. He was younger than me. I'm like, yo, what? And he's like, yeah, every time I open the Bible, the presence of God falls. I'm like, that's wild. Every time, that's wild. I open the Bible, and I'm like, I'm like fumbling. Like, what? I'm like, oh, I'm not going to read the names. It's like, it's chapters of names. I don't even, what? Ilzy, Bazzy, Bo, like, every time. And then I remember, and then I remember that, that I prayed for that. I prayed. And then they made me a teacher uh, in a private school. It's a long story. I started as a su substitute teaching English. That's what I studied in college. And they made me a teacher in a Bible school for high school and middle school. Even though I, I was just out of, pretty much out of college. And it started to happen that I would open the Bible and the presence of God would fall. I'm like, wow, you know why? God was like, I don't want that just for him. I want a people, not a superstar. Wow. The kingdom has a superstar. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs> Everything else is just God. So, so here's another question I have for you. Do you want what God is offering you? Do you want his presence? Because he, his presence wants you. And so, okay, this is the last scripture. This is Revelations 12, 13, 14. And this is talking about, I, I love how the Bible does this. Uh, prophetic language, I don't want to get deep, sometimes it's not clear with time. And this is why even when you get a pre prophetic word and the Lord says, and the Lord says he's about to do this, and then it's like three years later, you're like. Because sometimes prophetic language is hard to understand, right? So he's, he's putting all these things together when Satan fell from heaven. When the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. So that means that the devil, ever since God told him, after he made Adam and Eve fall, this is what this means. Ever since God told him, and I'm going to use the seed of the woman. By the way, the children, 
don't, the children don't bother me. That's the seed of the woman. It's a blessing. When, 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 when he said, when he said, I'm going to use the seed of the woman, the devil always had that in his mind. There's going to be a child that comes out that's going to destroy me. Right? You see, we see all those Disney movies, nothing but a copy of this. So when the dragon realized that he had been thrown down to earth, he pursued the woman who had, been, who had given birth to the male child. This is why when Moses was born, he killed, he got the king to kill every firstborn because he knew there's going to be a, a, a child born. And Moses was a deliverer, but he wasn't the savior, but he was a deliverer. But she was given two wings, like those of a great eagle, so she could fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness. The woman is Mary. I wanna cry, the woman is Mary. And she, wasn't, she didn't fly. So what do you mean you gave her two wings? What does that mean? When a bird flies, it could see the opposition ahead and it could go way above it so it can't be reached by the opposition. It can't be touched by the opposition. So what he's basically saying here is, I moved, I made sure nothing could stop her. And what could stop her possibly? The army finding out where she is. At the time, the, you know, the people pursuing, they could find out, right? But what happens is God made sure no one is going to be able to stop you. No one is going to. And so, so in his language, I gave her wings. So this is what Isaiah 40, 31 says. This is what it means. I will, you will mount up on wings like eagles, meaning whatever is an obstacle, whatever is seeking to destroy you. What was seeking to destroy Mary? Whatever is seeking to destroy you, whatever is an obstacle, right? They were, they were trying to kill the firstborn, whatever. Is, 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 is an obstacle, whatever seeking to destroy you, whatever plan the enemy has, I'm gonna give you wings and you're gonna go above it. So what is, so what is the, the opposition you're facing? What is it that is coming against you? Depression, rejection, anger, confusion, lust. What is it that's, that the Lord is saying, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will, they will mount up on wings like eagles. So he's actually saying, obviously Mary didn't have literal wings, but in the spirit she did. In the spirit, anything that was in opposition, God would lift her above it. He would take her beyond it. He would, he would not allow it to touch her. He would give her vision of what is to come. Like a, like, a, like a bird, an eagle can see. An eagle can see and has the best vision and can hone in. Someone say vision. God is going to give you vision so that the opposition to you is far away and can't touch you. So what, it, what the Bible is saying here is, if you wait upon me, then you will understand the word. If you wait upon me, then you will encounter my presence. If you wait upon me, I remember I was evangelizing the first year I was saved. I was evangelizing every week. And I wasn't doing it like some religious task, like I have to evangelize to this amount of people. And I wasn't doing any of that. It was just because, as I told many of you, Jesus was the, came to me like, like shock and awe. I wasn't raised in church, I didn't have that blessing. So when Jesus came to me, I was in shock that he was that real. And it just shocked me like, God, I can't believe, there's times that I would be in his presence and I would thank God for God because I was so in despair without him. And so I wanted everybody to know about this real Jesus, not the Jesus in the painting, not the Jesus in, 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 in mass, no, the real Jesus that will actually fill your heart, the real Jesus that, that was more exciting to me than the drugs I used to do, the real Jesus that I could feel as much as the drugs I used to do, the real Jesus. I need people to know about the real Jesus. So I would go everywhere, everywhere, everywhere because I wanted people to know. And I remember I didn't see one person come to Christ and I'm like, God, this is a privilege either way. But I asked the Lord, Lord, let me at least see one person. And the Lord led me. Literally one day he told me. I, I went out and I'm like, I'm going to go on the bus. I didn't have a car. I'm going to go on a bus and I'm going to go to my friend's house. And then I was like, Lord, show me where you want me to go. And then, and then, and then I was going to get on the bus. And I turned and I saw a sign. I know it sounds funny. It was a car sign that was like, it was like one of those license plates on a car. And it said, forget about it. Like a New York Italian. And I was like, and then I heard a voice that said, walk down, turn left. And I'm like, this is crazy. This is crazy. It was a hot summer in Miami. It's like worse than here. I was like, this is crazy. Walk down, turn left. I did it. And then, he, and then I heard the, the voice of God, went, turn left again and then turn right. And then when I was going to go do it, another voice was like, just go home. Just go home. You're close to home. Just go home. And I went and I did. I didn't know where God was taking me. And then finally, my friend had moved. I didn't know where he moved. I saw my friend's car. I'm like, I think that's my friend's car. And then the voice of God told me the second window. And I looked and, the, and, and we were, I think at the time, 
23-24, and, and he, there was a, there was a, uh, 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 the second window had a cat in the window, and the first door had like beers and a chair, so I'm like, no, that has to be him. And I knocked on the first door, the voice told me the second door, when I did, a mutual friend came out the second door. That's how my friend got radically saved, radically, radically saved, who was a rave DJ who was, and remained saved. And so, and so I, I asked the Lord, Lord, I'm a, it's a privilege, but I just want to see one person. See, here's the thing, God honors those who honor him. And so when you're like, Lord, I worship you, and I worship you because you're good, whether I feel you or I don't, but Lord, let me feel you, he'll show up. Yes. Lord, I, 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 I love you and I appreciate you, so I'm gonna read your word even when I don't understand it, but Lord, let me understand it. He's gonna let you understand it. There's only a matter of time before he's gonna give you wings. Someone say, he's gonna give me wings. Give wings. And whatever situation you feel stuck in, the Lord is gonna give you wings and he himself is gonna take you out and you're gonna say, how did this happen? But you can't give up. Someone say, don't give up. This is a crucial moment. Don't allow the atmosphere. And here's another thing. Make a decision to change your atmospheres. Don't put yourself back in an atmosphere that's going to consume you. And so...